An explosive new memoir is giving a stunningly candid look at former President Donald Trump detailing the many illegal actions Trump and his aides were suggesting to top military brass, such as shooting American protesters in the nation's capital or firing missiles on Mexican drug labs, withholding aid to Ukraine that Congress had already signed off on, and on one occasion, suggesting the U.S. publicly brandish the bloodied head of ISIS leader al-Baghdadi as a trophy. All this in a new book, A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Secretary of Defense During Extraordinary Times, written by Trump's Defense Secretary Mark Esper. He served in that position from July 2019 until November 2020, only to be fired by a tweet six days after the presidential election. Secretary Esper joins us now. Secretary Esper, I want to ask you about those shocking claims in a moment, but first, some news of the day. Today we found out that the House Select Committee investigating the insurrection is sending subpoenas to House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy for other House Republicans. What, what's your reaction? You know, Jake, as you mentioned, it's breaking news. I haven't had a chance to read up and find out what's going on. I, I do think it's important at the end of the day that the January 6th committee get to the bottom of what happened and understand it, uh, make sure there is accountability, and figure out how we prevent this from happening again. It was a tragic day in our nation's history. We've learned in recent days that Kevin McCarthy was thinking about at one point or discussing uh, invoking the 25th Amendment that allows a president to be removed from office. He was doing this in the days after January 6th. He ultimately concluded it would take too long. There are tapes of him saying this. In your book, you say you never believed Trump's conduct rose to the level of needing to invoke the 25th Amendment when you were in the cabinet. But if you had been Secretary of Defense in the days after January 6th, and if it had come up for a vote, would you have voted to remove him from office? Boy, Jake, I, you know, I don't know. You have to be there in the moment to understand and assess the situation and have a chance to, you know, look at the president under fire in, in that moment. Uh, clearly what he did uh, was antithetical to what we believe in as a democracy, right? He undermined the election for weeks. He incited people to come to D.C., stirred them up that morning, and then failed to call them off. And I in my view, that was undermining our democracy, the hallmark of which is a free and fair election and the peaceful transfer of power. So, uh, you know, I don't know where I would have stood, but I would have, you know, taken a serious look at it and I think come to the proper judgment. We've seen in recent months uh, the importance of Ukraine getting that military aid uh, that Donald Trump tried to hold up uh, initially uh, during uh, the actions that led to his first impeachment. In your book, you say you repeatedly warned uh, Donald Trump that withholding military aid to Ukraine uh, was not only illegal, but it would further weaken Zelensky's government. In hindsight, looking back on it, do you think Trump's resistance to helping Ukraine, uh, the way that he behaved towards De Zelensky, do you think that emboldened Putin in any way uh, to, to, to act as aggressively as we're seeing today? Well, first things first, you know, it, it is true, I talk about this, that John Bolton, uh, the National Security Advisor, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, and I at various times uh, would engage individually or together uh, with the President and, and talk him into releasing this funding for a variety of reasons, right? Just first to bolster this democracy, to deter Russia, and then ultimately for me that it was the law, that the Congress had appropriated it. That said, uh, you know, I, I don't think it made a material difference. It was three years ago at this point. I do want to give the president credit. I think the administration did the right thing by providing lethal aid in the form of the javelins and then, of course, conducting training in western Ukraine, which I had the chance to visit. But I'm, I'm not sure three years later that, that it had an, a material impact on what's happening today. You write that Trump always had a soft spot for Putin. Why, why do you think that is? I don't know. He, he tended to have that same soft spot for other strongmen, whether it was Putin or Xi Jinping. And uh, I couldn't explain it. Uh, it is just what it was. And in some ways, I think, as I write with regard to our China policy, and, and by the way, I think that the administration was successful in consolidating an American consensus, if you will, that China is a strategic adversary. But in some ways, the president's willingness to engage Xi Jinping and treat him as a friend, in some ways, kind of undermined that. In your book, you say Trump and his aides were suggesting ideas such as shooting American protesters in the nation's capital, using the military to stay in power, bombing America's neighbor surreptitiously in Mexico, and having the U.S. commit a war crime by dipping al-Baghdadi's head in pig's blood. What do you say to critics who, who 
might say, you know, the time to share those stories was before the 2020 election uh, so that the American people could make an infirm, informed choice, not now when you're trying to sell books. Well, look, it's, it's a great question, and it's an issue I struggled with uh, through a good part of my tenure. I write about this in the opening pages of my book, you know, should I stay or should I go? And, you, you know, my view was at the end of the day, given that I, I had the chance to continue to advancing good initiatives in, at the Pentagon, right? Building our cyber capabilities, proposing a new Navy, modernizing the armed forces, building trust with allies and partners. Between that and the fact that I was able successfully over a period of months to push back on these outlandish ideas, I thought that my higher sense of duty was to the, was to the country to stay and not to leave. Because look, it would have saved me a lot of grief and heart weight, heartache to walk away. But I just didn't think that would put the country in the right position. And I consulted folks like uh, my predecessors from both parties, uh, even the late General Colin Powell, and to a person, they said, look, you need to stay. And that became my goal, is get to the election, prevent bad stuff from happening, and continue to try and advance a positive agenda within the Pentagon. And you, you say in the book that you never publicly uh, rebuked Trump while you were defense secretary because you thought he would he would take the opportunity to fire you and you never resigned because, as you just noted, you worried Trump would replace you uh, with a loyalist, somebody who would carry out any order. Um, you, but you do also write about how, in, at least in one instance, Trump's loyalists uh, would work around you in ways. Um, Stephen Miller, for example, uh, directed the Department of Homeland Security to develop a concept to deploy a couple hundred thousand plus U.S. troops to the border, even after you told him that was not possible. You write, quote, I was shocked. I asked questions no one had good answers for. Who approved this? When did this begin? Why weren't we informed? How far along were they? While I was not surprised Miller was working this, I was frustrated that no one senior at Northcom thought to let us or anyone at the Pentagon, for that matter, know. It's really quite a shocking revelation. How often do you think things like that were going on that you didn't catch until uh, towards the very end? Well, there were things or like maybe that, not at all. that happened, and it picked up more toward things like that that happened picked up more toward the end of the administration. But you know, first things first. You you mentioned publicly rebuking him. Of course, I did. Right on June third, I came out and publicly spoke about invocation of the Insurrection Act. I I had to speak out in January twenty twenty when he proposed bombing Iranian cultural and historic sites, and I had to say, no, that's not wrong. We don't. The U.S. military doesn't do that. Going back to the you know Eddie Gallagher episode in in the fall of twenty nineteen, I spoke up and said that I had hoped that the president would allow the military process to work its way through. Uh, so there were times I had to do that. But near the end, after June, for example, I was trying not to get in, uh, you know, crosswise with the president because uh, I, there was so much going on. And so these outlandish ideas kept coming forward that I wanted to make sure I didn't get fired too soon. I wanted to be there uh, to, to act in what I thought was the best interest of the country. So I had to be on guard, as did, you know, General Milley and others within the Pentagon, to make sure folks weren't going around us to to do this or that. And, and I talk about some of those things in the book. I know you said that uh, you, you'll never vote for Donald Trump again uh, and you don't think he should be president again. Would you uh, work for a Republican, uh, endorse a Republican in a primary to defeat Donald Trump if it comes to that? Sure. If it's somebody that I believed in, that somebody is promoting, you know, traditional uh, Republican policies like in, uh, lower taxes, a strong defense, of course, border security, things like that. They have to be a person of integrity and principle. And look, they have to put country above self and, and try and unify the country and not be divisive. So if somebody meets criteria like that, absolutely, I'd, I'd support them in the primary. Former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, thank you. His new book, A Sacred Oath, is out now. Uh, Secretary Esper, we'll have you back. We've got a lot more, lot more questions for you, and these issues keep continuing. Thank you so much for being with us.